Support comes from Thomas Nelson Community College, the first choice to make college possible. As education costs rise, Thomas Nelson's affordable tuition, financial aid, and scholarships make college accessible to everyone. More at tncc.edu. Support comes from Hampton Roads Community Foundation, carrying out your charitable wishes forever. Whether it's helping shelter animals, feeding the homeless, enhancing the arts, or supporting students. Learn more at leaveabequest.org. Hello, everyone. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Dr. Martin Luther King famously lamented that 11 a.m. on Sunday is the most segregated hour in Christian America. Some may argue that the statement is no longer true. But what is the role of the Christian church when it comes to eliminating racism? Is it the responsibility of churches, and predominantly white churches in particular, to promote diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice? One local church has decided to tackle racism head on, and we'll talk about their efforts next on Another View. Stay tuned. We'll be right back after this national, regional, and local news from NPR and WHRV News. Discussing today's topics from an African-American perspective, this is Another View. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Another View. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Before we get started today, I must say thank you, thank you, thank you to all of you who decided to become a member of WHRV, WHRO Public Media, and particularly in support of Another View. We raised $5,674 in one hour. There we go. (laughs) So we are very, very excited. Thank you so much for your support. And you know, you can become a member at any time. All you have to do is dial 1-800-940-7170, and they will be happy to take your membership. Join the family. We have a lot of fun. So if you know your history, then you know that the African-American church is ground zero in the fight for civil rights in this country. At the height of the civil rights struggles of the 60s, it was the church where where black folks gathered to strategize, mobilize, and pray for strength as they marched for justice. And while we know that there were white allies who showed up in solidarity, we also know that the white Christian church also used religion to marginalize African Americans and, quote, keep them in their place. So what about today? In this time of racial reckoning, what is the role of the Christian church? Well, one church in our area is doing what it can to educate its congregation about racism in the hopes of changing hearts and minds. Williamsburg Baptist Church is on a mission to learn how to fight racism, starting with the guest speaker series. We are pleased to have as their first guest speaker, um, as a guest on our show today, his name is Cyrus Comier, author of Wandering Through the Fire. Hi, Cyrus. How are you? Hi, Barbara, and thank you for having me. Me. Thank you so much for being here. We appreciate that. And joining him is Lynn Underwood, author of The First Stone and moderator of the Leadership Council at Williamsburg Baptist Church, among many other things that he does <laughs> at the church. Hey, Lynn, how you I, doing? I'm fine, Barbara. <laughs> Thank you very much for having us. And thank the reader or the listeners for tuning in. Oh, so, fantastic. Yes. And as a matter of fact, um, Cyrus is from Houston, Texas, and there are a lot of folks from Houston, Texas listening to us online right now. So we want to say welcome to another view. And hopefully this will not be your last time, but your first time on the journey with us. So yeah. we appreciate you putting that out there, Cyrus. Thank you. So let, let me start with you. So why is Williamsburg Baptist Church doing this? Well, uh, several reasons, Barbara. Um, I think, number one, we are active uh, actively against our we, we want to promote social justice and all it's called and all its ways means and everything about it uh racism for example even though we're mostly a white church mm-hmm. uh we decry racism in all of its forms we see it we recognize it and we want to do something about it uh we are a an open and inclusive um church congregation uh which means we basically support and encourage lgbtq members and participants and we welcome them with open arms we ex- acknowledge their 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 who they are and we accept it exactly the way they are mm-hmm. uh and i guess more than anything else we we feel like 
looking at the kingdom of God is very diverse. The kingdom of God is diverse. We want to be like that diverse kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. I think it's that more than anything else. Uh, we we are mostly white, and we acknowledge that uh, there at you know the church was founded in the 1820s, and ha having churches founded that far back, you can anticipate sure. that there was a lot of people that were part of that church, maybe even leaders of that church, that maybe were slave owners, for mm -hmm. example, or maybe were slaves themselves. They were still members of the church. Um, we recognize that, and we would like to acknowledge it, uh, take ownership of it. And then try to do what we can to correct that mm -hmm. and uh, make things right. You know, I've, I went to your website and I was uh, looking through throughout and you have a, an entire page on um, uh, being welcoming and inclusionary yeah. for LGBTQ plus mm -hmm. um, people. And there's there's ve it's very conversational and, you know, Q&A right. kind of kind of thing. You also have on your homepage a statement about racism, mm -hmm. um, but it is a statement that is a joint statement of mm -hmm. a lot of churches. Mm -hmm. Do you think that once you go through this series, once you all read this book and so forth, that you might create a page about racial diversity that is as um, welcoming and is as, you know, the same type of Q&A kind of mm -hmm. friendly Here's some information about us. Absolutely, Barbara. That would be my goal personally, mm -hmm. is to be able to make a positive statement, uh, a uh, an affirming statement that recognizes not just, like you said, uh, the, um, the 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 CBF uh, motif or, or um, I, I guess statement that they've used, but mm -hmm. our own and mm -hmm. and come to grips with it ourselves. Uh, that will take time to to craft and to uh, to make appropriate. Uh, for us and appropriate for society, our community. So that is a goal I have. And thank you very much for reminding us. Okay. So Cyrus is going to be speaking tomorrow from uh, 3 to 4.30 p.m. at Williamsburg Baptist Church. And Cyrus, your topic is um, is uh, facing our fears about racism. And I notice in the title, you say facing our fears as opposed to facing your fears, meaning um, more inclusive. Because it, as I read your book and so forth, you really look at the whole racial issue on both sides. And, and it's so important that we look on both sides. And so when I, when I speak about fear, it, it's not only the black fear uh, of what can happen to us as the people, mm -hmm. but it's also the fears that white people have about black people and the lack of cultural in intelligence and, and what those fears bring mm -hmm. and what's birthed out of those fears. And until we address those fears, until we understand those fears, we're at a stalemate right now and, and we're with zero progress. And when, once we have the dialogue and, and, you know, everybody loves to talk about having the conversation, we'll, We've been having a conversation for 402 years. So mm -hmm. it's, it's time to move past that conversation. Mm -hmm. And we can't pass that conversation without facing the fears. Mm -hmm. So without giving away your whole speech <laughs> <laughs> for tomorrow, but, but what are some of the fears that you want to point out to this predominantly white congregation that you'll be speaking to okay. tomorrow? Right. So uh, the, when I talk about fears, it, the, the first fear would be the fear of the unknown. So there's so many things within black culture that um, people don't know and don't understand. And, and so it's, it's the unknown. It's just like anything that's unknown, we're scared of. Uh, uh, we don't understand or people don't understand like wearing hair. There's nothing wrong with braids. I, I can remember back in the 70s, if somebody on my job had braids, a mm -hmm. black, or a big afro, or a big afro <laughs> I, like I have one now, <laughs> then people were afraid. I, a perfect example is, is the afro. I remember the first time I had my hair cut into an afro style, mm -hmm. my mother sent me right back to that barbershop <laughs> and said, oh no, you get that bold haircut because people will look at you as a threat because you have an Afro, they will associate you with a Black Panther, who was a great organization, by the way, that was 
totally uh, a narrative was given about the Black Panther that was so false. Mm -hmm. and, and so we have to go beyond the unknown and we have to have the education uh, about black culture and, and what it means. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm not going to give you all of my fears, but I'll give you another fear. Sure. The fear of fear. So people mm. are, are genuinely just scared for no reason. We are scared that something is going to happen to us all the time. We are scared mm -hmm. because we are all survivors. Everybody has survived something. If you're still on planet Earth, you have survived something. And some people, survival is a lot more horrific than others. But just the fear on the black side of going through things. And in my book, I talk about, you know, when I was in the eighth grade, <clears throat> policemen pulled over, you know, a bunch of eighth grade kids walking home and pointed guns at us. And and so to be afraid all the time of something that's gonna happen to you, or a woman being afraid that a man is gonna do something to him, or a, a, a child being afraid that they're gonna be abused, mm -hmm. that constant living in fear is, is just horrible. And how can we get beyond the fear of fear? Wow, that's, so Lynn was the, Speaking of fear, <laughs> was this um, initiative a bottom-up initiative or a top-down? I think it was. Uh, our our pastor organized a, um, a a a retreat where we would leadership retreat where we would go and work out things that we all think thought would be good to sort of bring to the church itself, mm -hmm. and this emerged out of that. There, there was a lot of interest in having um, high-level speakers that would sort of guide us mm -hmm. uh, in in toward the future. Something I want to tell, say about fear, if it's okay, sure, absolutely. Uh, is a, a mutual friend of ours, Nody, told me one time, fear you're talking about, and the, the kids, you know, having police. Uh, he, uh, he, I asked him one time, how did you get so good at running? You know, he was he was in track, and he said, I live in Joplin, Missouri. We hear a police siren, we run. Doesn't matter where we run, we just run. Mm -hmm. And and I mean, that, that's awful to have that kind of um, thing that you suffer with, you know, as, as a, as a youth like that. Mm -hmm. And we have, we maybe as white America have done that. And it, it's, I think it's a church's role is to do everything it can to reverse it. Because I think a lot of the church over the last several hundred years has made it so, or kept it in, in the condition that it's in. Mm -hmm. So, um, I don't know if that answers why your question. Do, why do you think it is so difficult? And I ask this to both of you. Why is it so difficult for particularly white people to understand that there is a completely different experience of living in this country when your skin is not white? Why is that so hard? I'm going to start with you, Lynn, and I'll come to you, Cyrus. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> my, my first impression is the why is because they don't have a friend who's in that race, a close friend. So, something that Jamar Tisby has written about in the book that we are using as a study guide for its fight on combat, how to fight racism. Mm -hmm. uh, he uses the acronym ARC, A-R-C. Uh, ARC, awareness of the problem. R, relationship. Uh, C, commitment. Relationship, he points out that uh, we don't associate with people of a different race. We tend to avoid that. And, and we... Sure. I mean, the, the average white person will say, oh, gosh, I've got a whole bunch of black friends. You know, they don't. I mean, the, the average every Google search I've done is the average white person has between one and two black mm -hmm. friends that are real close friends. But the, the average black person will have eight or ten good mm -hmm. white friends. We don't spend the time to, to, to create friendships across cultural lines. We don't make that effort. Something he also pointed out in his book was um, when he was given a talk, he said this um, crusty old, uh, maybe country-looking boy, white boy, came up to him and said, hey, you drink beer? And Jamar didn't know what was going to happen, so he said, well, yeah, I do. Well, let's have a beer sometime and talk about it. And We don't do that very much as, as a people, and I think that's what's necessary. In order to make that happen, what about you, from your perspective, Cyrus? Well, from from my perspective, I, I can look back at, at different things throughout my life, and and I can look at uh, being on the job. So early in my career, I became a manager, <clears throat> and so I would be the only black guy 
in a lot of uh, instances. And they've done that. <laughs> right. And, and, and then uh, uh, my white colleagues would think that they would be give, giving me a compliment by saying, you're not like other black people. <laughs> and they said it with so much pride. And, and it was, I was in a position and I'm, you know, in a room filled with other white managers. It's like, you know what, sometimes it's best just to be quiet. Yeah. And, but it was so painful to hear because you know what? I'm, I'm not like any other black people and I'm not like any other white people. I'm not like any other Asian people. I am just like Cyrus, like I am supposed to be, like you are supposed to be. And so for them to put uh, people in a box, and that's what they were doing <clears throat> by making that comment, mm -hmm. they don't understand that we are just as unique as anybody that is white, that is anybody that is Asian or any other ethnicity. And, and so they are missing uh, the key component to what humanity is mm. by putting us in a box. Well, Cyrus, didn't, don't you think that, it, that all those guys that did that to you, none of them had a real close black friend, right? But, I was their only black friend, <laughs> okay. and, and I got a whole thing on, on black friends, uh, Lynn. So, <laughs> so, uh, but they didn't know to ask the question, or for you to feel comfortable mm -hmm. enough to say what you just said to us. They, they you know, they didn't no. feel right. They, they didn't, and and so the whole thing about being a, a black friend. Don't tell me I'm your black friend. Tell me I'm your, your friend. friend. Either I'm right. your friend or you, right. I'm not your friend. I'm not, I'm not your black friend. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to be the one black friend that you have to make you feel good about yourself. Well, and that also yeah. means that then you become also the one black spokesperson for every black spoke, right. every black right. person. And that that's another area in right. which that, that same type of thing happens where there's this expectation that because you you happen to be someone that another white person is comfortable with, mm -hmm. that you therefore take on the, a bigger persona um, in terms of representing the entire race, and right. you know, and and in, in particular for African Americans, that is a, a unique um, uh, phenomenon that we have that we take on the responsibility of right. the entire right. race. You know, when we especially when we're in in public, and we and we do it to ourselves. We, my wife and I, we used to watch the news together and we'd be watching the news and something bad would happen. And we'd say to each other, oh, I hope oh, that I am black man. Mm -hmm. Jeez, please don't let it be. <laughs> like a black man, one person that does something bad is the whole race doing something right. bad. But that label, you're right, that gets put on black people, just like black on black crime. People don't love to talk about black on black crime. Well, you know what? There's a lot more white on white crime n numerically than there is black on black crime. But you never hear about white on white crime. Right. It's just a crime. It's just a crime. Right. 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 <laughs> <laughs> it's just the, a crime. The same is true with theology. Yeah, the, the, the term, the word theology is mm -hmm. theology when it's European theology. But when it's another culture, mm -hmm. it's black theology or it's it's a. Uh, Another race or another country's mm -hmm. theology. Mm -hmm. We we tend to think of white theology as, as only the, theology. Right, as the, the, the theology. 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240 are the numbers to call to join our conversation. We're talking with Cyrus Comier, and he's the author of Facing Our Fears. I'm, I'm sorry, that's not his book. His book is Wandering Through the Fire. <laughs> <laughs> and his talk tomorrow at Williamsburg Baptist Church is Facing Our Fears About Racism. So, Cyrus, let me ask you a question, because a lot of people bring this up um, when I do, um, you know, I do diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice training for nonprofits mm -hmm. and corporations. And um, a lot of times in our conversations, a white person will say, "Well, black people are are racist too, because they, you know, X Y Z. They said this about uh, about white people or so forth." You know, I posit that, um, and others posit that racism in um, two components, key components are power and control. Mm -hmm. And so do you think that can can African Americans be racist or are they prejudiced? 
Oh, okay. <laughs> so l- l- let's unpack racism. Mm-hmm. So for me, racism is two things. Racism is an act and it's a belief. The act of racism is suppression and oppression. That's the act. To, when, when you exert power to disadvantage an ethnicity, that's mm-hmm. the act of racism. The belief of racism is I believe that I'm superior to you. Mm-hmm. My people are more superior to you. And, and, and so those are two distinct things. So when you ask the question, can black people be racist? I say, yes, black people mm. can be racist. And, and, case, and black people can be racist towards black people. So it, I, I'm, I'm of Creole descent. My parents from Louisiana, they migrated to Houston from Louisiana and they spoke Creole. And so anybody that was from Louisiana back in the 60s and early 70s, so white people looked down on us because we were black. Black people from Texas called us Geechee and they looked down on us because we were blacks from Louisiana and we had this accent, meaning that this accent somehow made us less than, this accent made us uh, not as intelligent. And it was the same narrative that the Portuguese did to all of black people mm-hmm. in the 1450s. So the Portuguese, this, th- th- they were pretty smart, oh, cruel but smart. So the Portuguese, they hired this guy named Gomez de Zara. And they said, hey, we need you to write this book. We need to create a narrative that dehumanizes all the black people in Africa, because we need that narrative so we can enslave them. And the way we can enslave them and people buy it is we, we got to sell this story, this narrative, and we sell it to the church. If the church buys it, the church is going to promote it for us. And that's what they did. And so this guy, he, he writes this book and he calls black people, all the people in Africa, inferior and beastly. Mm. And he says, hey, you know what? These black people, they are just, they are just so vile. And, and then media, they promote it as well. They come up with this character. You may have heard of him, Tarzan. Tarzan. Mm-hmm. So Tarzan, Johnny Wise Miller, this white boy, he, he, he gets stuck in the jungle, his parents get killed in a plane crash, in some hot kind of way, as a baby, these apes take to him and say, hey, come on with us. <laughs> and he becomes the king of the jungle. He can swing on vines. But no black people can swing on vines in Africa on the, on the short Tarzan. No black people can talk to the animals, but this white boy who came, he can talk. And you know what? Black people are cheering Tarzan every Saturday morning throughout America. But where does that come from? Conditioning. It comes from conditioning. Mm -hmm. It comes from the narrative. The narrative that was sold in the 1400s is still the white tool being used today Mm -hmm. to advantage and disadvantage different groups of people. So what, as, as you talk about facing the fear, what exactly does that mean? What, what do people need to do um, before they can start to work on whether they are racist or whether they think racist thoughts and so forth? Um, after you face the fear, then what? So it, if I look in the mirror and, and I see the different areas of my life that I'm lacking, and I say, Cyrus, you need to improve on being a better father. Cyrus, you need to improve on being a better husband. Cyrus, you need to I- improve on being a better whatever. When I face that, when I face the mirror and I have an open conversation with me about me, I, mm-hmm. I got to change because the conversations that we have with ourselves, the conversations that we have with other people, conversations always leads to two things. Conversation leads to truth, 
-hmm. and conversation leads to reconciliation. And that's why the whole issue with race, most white America does, don't want to have that conversation. They don't want the truth. And they certainly don't want reconciliation. You wrote in your book, the only quote, the only person you must be better than is the person you were yesterday. That's right. It, I, I'm not in competition with Lynn. I'm not in competition with Barbara. I'd lose in the competition with Barbara for sure. <laughs> I, I, I'm not in, I, I just got to be a better me today than I was yesterday. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Four four zero two six six five or one eight hundred nine four zero two two four zero are the numbers to call to join our conversation. We're talking about the role of the church in term- making a difference in terms of racism, and we're talking with uh, Cyrus Comier, author of Wandering Through the Fire, and Lynn Underwood, author of The First Stone. Four four zero two six six five one eight hundred nine four zero two two four zero. So, Cyrus, back to my point about being prejudiced for black folks versus being racist. Um, You have a story in your book where you talk about your uh, experience with a high school teacher. Okay, And so uh, I I had this high school teacher. First of all, I, I, I need to bring it back. My story first starts with my mom and dad, and they are super into uh, all their kids being educated. Mm-hmm. All their kids, we we have to make straight A's. There is no a B is not acceptable in our house, <clears throat> and so to get to straight A's, I had to go through a lady in my twelfth grade, Mrs. Bentley, and Mrs. Bentley was known to be just this ruthless teacher. She was just brutal. And, and so to, to get an A in her class, you really had to give it all. And so I saw her, even though I didn't know her, I saw her as this uh, heavyset, ruthless, racist white woman that I had to face. And so, you know, I took the class. That was you judging her. That's me right judging off, her. Right off the top. Right. Okay. All right. And so I, I took the class, and every time I would submit work, she would give it back to me, and the grade was always less than what I felt I deserved. And no matter what I did, she just tore up my work, and I could tell by other people's work she was not doing the same thing. And she sat me down one day, and she said, Cyrus, she said, you have a talent for writing, and you are just just, uh, halfway doing the work. You are not giving me your all. And I, I, I was upset and I halfway took it as a compliment. I I was probably egotistical. I probably still am. But anyway, (laughs) so I I, I was upset that she said I was halfway doing it, but I, and I wasn't giving it my all. And, and uh, I was up for a scholarship, a Worthing scholarship given for several reasons. Uh, You had to submit a paper. You had to have good grades, you had to be involved in school, you had to be involved in the community. Mm -hmm. And so the last day for me to submit my write-up for the Worthing Scholarship, she came to me and she said, hey, let me, me, did did you turn in your write? I said, no, I didn't turn in any write-up. I said, there are so many other people in Houston that are a lot better than me. I I know I'm not going to get it. She said, oh, no. She said, you're going to sit down right now and you're going to write it. And she made me submit a, a writing for the Worthing Scholarship. A couple of weeks later, I won the Worthing Scholarship. So the lesson learned, we, we don't know who will enter our path during this life that is here to help us, and we should never prejudge somebody. You say in the book, I learned from Mrs. Bentley that when, there, that when we leave our judge robes in the closet and allow room in our lives for learning and listening, we can sometimes unleash our highest potential. And that is so absolutely true. So, Len, is that something that you do hope that congregants and others from the community that come to this series and participate in, in these discussions, that they learn to to actually open themselves up and listen That's before they make, make a choice? Absolutely, Barbara. My, my goal is to have them become friends with people across the lines, whatever the lines are, mm-hmm. and our our pastor, every before every sermon, he will talk about how welcome you are, no matter what 
you are. If you're Democrat or Republican, you're welcome. If you're uh, gay or straight, you're welcome. Uh, w- whatever the difference is, races, you're welcome. We, we see each other as, I, what I would wish that we would see each other is there's a painting that Norman Rockwell did called Do Unto Others. And I, I, we have that hanging in the front mm-hmm. of our church. Uh, just put it up. Mm-hmm. But we, w- we want that kind of um, uh, feeling in our church so that we accept, we're accepting, we're open. We, we are open as it is. Uh, but more than that, we're not just looking to do this for our church. We're hoping that we can set a model and maybe set a, set a, set, show other people the way to do this. Maybe other churches, maybe it's a community, mm-hmm. but we want to be able to show people how you can do that sort of thing. So that's our goal. Okay, 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. Uh, is that Wynn? Wynn joins us from Chesapeake. Hi, Wynn. You're on the air. Hi there. Thanks for having me. Sure. Um, I had a question. As I was raised in the church, I'm a pastor's kid um, up north, but um, I was curious about the role of white saviorism and kind of the missionary aspect of churches. A lot of churches will partner with an organization like World Vision or others um, to do like an adopt-a-kid program, and they're typically kids in in Africa or in South America. And so I'm curious as to how that kind of aspect, because it's still very much alive and well within the church, um, really plays into preserving kind of a legacy of us and them and of racism within the church. Mm, That's a really good question. Thanks, Wynn. Because sometimes people, it's the whole idea of, of, the white savior syndrome, if you will, um, where you come in and you swoop in yeah, and you right. take care because they can't take care of themselves. Let me get your response, Lynn, and then I'm coming to you, Cyrus. About the only response I can give is um, I hope that we don't do that. However, we do uh, have a sister church in Cuba that we work with on a regular basis. We've made trips there. We've helped them work. Uh, they have very, very few materials, for example. So we've worked to... Uh, give them money to buy materials so they can restore their church, for example. And we have regular communication uh, through email with, with members. So it's more than just you all going down there doing something and then leaving. Right. And it's a maintain, it's a maintained relationship years and years and years. Okay. Cyrus. Well, I I can tell you uh, whether you are, are a white savior, whether you're a black savior, whether you are Asian or whatever, uh, ethnicity you are uh, you're doing you, you're Christian you're being Christ like and there is absolutely nothing wrong going and helping there's nothing wrong with feeding the hungry there's nothing wrong with clothing the naked there's nothing wrong with visiting the lonely when you do it for the right, right. reason you don't do it because, hey, you know what? I want to I'm superior right. and I'm going to help you because you can't help yourself. I'm going to help you because God told me I mm-hmm. should help you. Mm-hmm. And it, it's when we do it and we do it for the right reason and we do it without uh, recognition, that's when it becomes right. When I promote it and say, hey, you know, I'm with ABC Church and we went to uh XYZ country and we help uh, uh, DEF people Mm -hmm. that it's wrong. There's nothing wrong. In fact, you know, I I applaud churches, organizations that that uh, marry up and and take care of people that need help. Yeah. I have a question for you. When I go speak um, to various churches and and organizations um, and Cyrus, I'll come to you first on this. I'm always invited, you know, come to our church. We'd love to have you come experience our our service and so forth. But rarely, if ever, no, one time, I had one person say, I'd like to come to church with you. Yeah, right. right. What, the whole idea of white people getting out of their comfort zone and going to see something different. And And, and I've experienced that as well and i've uh been on both sides of that okay. and so and, and let me explain that to you so my wife and i we've moved 
um, 10 different times since we've been married for 41 years. And, and so we've lived all over Texas. We've lived all over New Mexico, Florida, Pennsylvania. And so every, and we were both born and raised Catholic. We grew up in the same neighborhood, went to the same church. Uh, and, and so every time we would go to a different city, we would look for a Catholic church. Mm-hmm. And, and so, uh, once we went, and I can't remember what city we were in, and so my wife had me call the diocese, hey, find a church. And so I called the diocese, hey, I'm new in town. I'm, I'm looking for a Catholic church. Can you tell me the nearest, this is where I live. Can you tell me where the nearest black Catholic church is? And I stunned the guy on the other side line. And he said, excuse me, sir, but there's no such thing as a black Catholic church. We only have a Catholic church. And I was just like, whoa, this is really, yes. <laughs> and, 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 and so, and, and you started the program and, and, and you spoke about the, the black church uh, really was the saving grace for civil rights. And, and that's absolutely mm-hmm. true. But today, after 402 years, there shouldn't be a black church. There shouldn't be a white church. There should just be a church where if, I'm a Christian, and I'm, and if I'm to be Christ-like, then I'm worshiping together. Mm-hmm. And I think, and I applaud uh, Lynn and Williamsburg Baptist Church because that's what they are seeking. Yeah, that's what they're striving for. Lynn, well, you uh, one thing that I can add is that our Sunday school class for adults, um, which is a spiritual formation class, mm-hmm. just finished reading a book called Holy Envy, and in that book, it was about a college professor teaching a religion class, and she taught all of the religions in the world to students. And she would have field trips on this, and she would take the students to different places, uh, different uh, uh, religious institutions, uh, synagogues and uh, uh, mosques. And Mm -hmm. she had made arrangements beforehand to bring them so that they could actually immerse themselves and learn. Uh, And I, I think that defines our church, which is intentionally looking for the best the best parts of all religions, because mm-hmm. uh, as good friends of mine have said uh, in the Middle East where I've worked, um, there's only one God to begin with. There, there's only one God. It, we all have different names, but there's only one God. Mm-hmm. So any way that someone else has built a religion to worship a God, then um, then we, we would like to share that. So what what have been, what's been the feedback from the church oh. in, in terms of, of this. Have you gotten any pushback? No, not at all. I mean, the, not at the, all. The, the, no, not at all. Everyone is completely behind this concept. Has uh, has volunteered uh, to work to make bring this about. We're not just doing this just for our congregation. We're doing this for the community. And of course, it's also free, so it's a gift to our community. Anyone that wants to come, and by the way, come early. Uh, I'm going to say 2:45 because we have a brass band that we'll be playing. Uh, some really cool music for about yeah, 20 I hear, minutes. I hear so. a man named Mr. Comey may have had something to do with that. Huh? Maybe so. <laughs> <laughs> he, said, he said something about wanting to have some pump you up music. And the first thing I could think was brass band. <laughs> Let's talk to Jean in Deltaville. Hi, Jean. You're on the air. Hi. How are you? Doing good. Um, I am actually Cyrus's publisher. Ah. And uh, the reason I'm calling is I'm wondering what... People who are, you know, publishing books and and processing information out there for the public, I'm wondering what we can do to do a better job of healing the divide that is present. Um, I'll tell you that when I published or was getting ready to publish Osiris' book, I got a lot of criticism from both sides. I got criticism because um, as a woman who was given a white suit when she was born, uh, (laughs) just, um, you know, what are you doing publishing a book about a black man's history? And then, of course, on the other side, why are you publishing books to stir this up anymore? So I'm just wondering, um, because it's something that I, I, I wrangle with every day, is what we can do to do a better job. Oh, that is a fantastic question. Who wants to start, Cyrus? Since you, since it's your publisher, <laughs> it, 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 it's our publisher. Okay. And, and and Jean, thank thanks for the question. And and we have to stand tall, and we have to stand united. And it it's it's not 
whether you're white and you're publishing something black, and it's not about uh, stirring something up. It, it's there. It, it's, per, it, it's in our face every day. It's uh, in, in the legal system. It, it's in the injustice. It's, it's in uh, our, our, the very fabric of what we do every day. And until we continue to have conversations until we go beyond conversations and have strategy, build strategies until we go beyond strategies and have tactics behind the strategies. And it's beyond the tactics till we get to action that we really make a difference. And the action that a publisher can do is to say, you know what, I'm, I'm going to publish books like this, whether the public likes it or not. And all good leaders throughout history, every good leader always gets a lot of criticism. Mm -hmm. yeah, you can't do it without criticism. Yeah, Gene, I was going to say the same thing. I mean, just keep publishing because if we don't put things out for people to mm -hmm. be able to experience, they'll never change their perception. I, I, I have one comment for Gene. I don't know if she knows this or not, but, um, well, first of all, she does know that the two books that I've written have cross-cultural uh, influences in the book and, mm -hmm. um, I have two brothers, one that was white, one that was, uh, his brother, his younger brother was adopted. Mm -hmm. uh, he was black and uh, adopted when they were five years old. Um, anyway, they grew up together as brothers. And so it was a little bit about them. Both books have them in it, both Zachary and Billy. Mm -hmm. uh, but something that I ask in a question to, um, oh, I had a writer's conference this last weekend. Mm -hmm. And I went to that writer's conference. And in the class on characterization, I raised my hand at the, when the questions were prompted, and I said, what what should I do if I'm a writer who writes about different races, different cultures? What should I do? And she didn't have a real good answer, but she ended up saying, maybe you should think about, maybe you shouldn't even write that. Maybe you should leave that to someone else. And I thought, well, that I think that's misguided, because if you, if, if, if you write about it, you kind of have to research it first. Mm -hmm. Even basic research, you learn something, and most writers, authors, are going to go out and talk to somebody and begin to learn something about another culture to begin with. And I think that would have been the right answer is to do that. And I think that's what we all should be doing mm -hmm. is talking to each other and having the mm -hmm. conversation you mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, is, and I don't think we do that enough. We don't have enough friends across our racial lines. Yeah. Cyrus, you know, if when you hear your life story, and, and people should get your book because it's very, very good. And you're very, I mean, talk about being an open book. You lay it out there. You could very easily be the angry black man. But and, you're not. And, and, you've, and I'm wondering why. You yeah. know, why did you decide that you would take a different tact than than to let it let your life experiences dictate how, you know, how you, you ultimately were going to turn out? Yeah. And, and, and so uh, I, I think I'm not an angry black man. I know I'm not an angry black man because my God tells me not to be an angry black man. Mm -hmm. And and there are so many people along the way that helped me. There are black and white that, you know, I, I first started, you know, with my parents that certainly guided me the right way. I, I, I look at Mrs. Bentley that guided me the right way. I, I look at my college coach, uh, a white man that I call daddy today that, mm. that led me the right way. And, and I think we all owe it to ourselves to lend and pay it forward and, and make ourselves better by making other people better. So there you go. We got, ooh, four minutes. That's all we have left. Let's see if we can get David from Norfolk on very quickly. David, you're on the air. We Hello, Mr. Hamley. Hello, gentlemen. Hi. I just wanted to make a excellent book recommendation to you. Sure. Dr. Frederick Casey Price did a book called Race, Religion, and Racism. There's three volumes, and it talks about the history of racism in the church and how the gospel was used to subvert, to subvert black people. So I just thought you might want to check that out and Y'all have a wonderful day. Thank you oh. so much. We appreciate that, and, that suggestion. And the author? Uh, David, can you Dr. tell us? Dr. Frederick Casey Price. Oh, Frederick Casey Price. Okay, good. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you very much. Um, so we only have about three minutes left. Um, a final thought that in terms of, of people coming that, that will come to hear you mm -hmm. speak tomorrow, you know, what's the ultimate message that you want them to walk away with? The ultimate message would be 
to um, make yourself better. Uh, just a real quick story. My 40-year class reunion, which was some years ago, by the way. <laughs> uh, a bunch of, you know, we, we had a reunion and uh, a lot of people came and spoke, you know, classmates. And so they were asking me to come up and speak. And I was like, no, y'all don't want me to speak. Oh, come on, sir, speak. No, you don't want me to speak. Come on, sir. So I go up there and I speak and I said that we were the first generation of integration when busing occurred and that was 40 years ago and you would think after 40 years we would have made some progress while we laugh and joke and we're here together we're really not together i said look around the table look around the room and what do you see every table was either all white right. all black or all hispanic i said we have come nowhere and i walked off that was a mic drop for me. <laughs> and yeah. and I, my, my message is I, I, I want everybody at everybody's table. I want uh, white people at black tables, black people at white tables or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, or like, um, I, I can't remember who, who said it. If, if I don't have a seat at the table, you know what? I'm going to bring a folding chair. Phyllis Wheatley said that. Mm. 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 Lynn, tell us again well, about where and when and so Ty forth. Cyrus is going to speak on uh, Friday, it's tomorrow, mm -hmm. at 3 o'clock to about 4.30 or so with questions and answers. Before that, come a little bit early because there's a brass band, 2.45, till about 3 or 3.05. Uh, but there's one plug I'd like to add, if sure. I can, for mm -hmm. the next day. Okay. The next day, uh, you can see both Cyrus and I at the Williamsburg Book Festival at the Stryker Center in Williamsburg from 8 to 4. He's going to be there. He's going to be autographing books. But uh, we'd love to have you come to the church as well or come to both. Okay. So, thank you. Gentlemen, it has been such a pleasure talking with both of you. And I really appreciate you being here and the work that you all are doing. And I wish you the very best of luck. That is Lynn Underwood and Cyrus Comier, both authors. Go check it out. And we'll be right back. Hi, this is Essie Pate Merkerson from Law and Order. You are listening to Another View. Todd just wanted to remind me that I need to go back and do some another some uh, law and order looking. Anyway, recently we've lost two legends: football great turned local restaurateur Roger Brown, and actor, director, and filmmaker Melvin Van Peoples. Our Lisa Godley looks back on their lives and the impact they made on America and on the world. We start our tribute with Roger Brown. Thundering in from the left side is the Ram who has become the greatest defensive end in the game. Roger Brown's legendary NFL career was shaped playing defensive tackle for the Detroit Lions and the Los Angeles Rams. During his 10 years in the NFL, the Surrey County, Virginia native was selected to the Pro Bowl six times. At 6'5 and 300 pounds, Brown wreaked havoc on the field. I know when I came into the Lions, I would have paid them to play. His most memorable game was on Thanksgiving Day in 1962 when Detroit played Green Bay. Brown sacked quarterback Bart Starr seven times. Roger Brown roars in on Bart Starr, forcing him to fumble. Brown was named outstanding defensive lineman that same year. He was traded to the Los Angeles Rams in 1967, where he played two seasons before retiring. Roger Brown was inducted into the Virginia Sports Hall of Fame in 1997, the College Football Hall of Fame in 2009, and the Pride of the Lions in 2018. In 2019, he was selected by the Detroit Free Press when ranking Detroit Lions' top 100 players of all time. Act two for Roger Brown was that of a restaurateur. After retiring from football, he opened a chain of eight restaurants in Chicago and three McDonald's franchises in Virginia. He also owned the Cove Taverns in Williamsburg and Newport News a brewery, and Roger Brown's restaurant and sports bar in Portsmouth. Roger Brown also made it a point to serve the Hampton Roads community. Over the years, he was involved in roughly 20 area organizations, boards, and partnerships, including serving as founder of the Black McDonald's Owner-Operator Association, 
president of the Southside Boys and Girls Club, and fundraising chair for the Ronald McDonald House Children's Charities. Roger Brown is survived by his wife, Catherine, of 28 years, his children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and many friends. Roger Brown was 84. Six days after Brown's death, another legend left us, actor, director, and filmmaker Melvin Van Peebles. Born in Chicago in 1932, Melvin Van Peebles never saw himself as a filmmaker. After earning his B.A. in literature from Ohio Wesleyan University, he enlisted in the Air Force. When it was time to transition from military into civilian life, Van Peebles took a job as a cable car gripman, a job he wrote about in his first book, The Big Heart. But it wasn't until a passenger recommended he become a filmmaker that he wrote, directed, and produced two short films. The first, Three Pickup Men for Herrick, which was followed by the film Sunlight. When Hollywood rejected his films, he got an invitation from Cinematheque to come to France. The French saw my films and they declared me a genius. And I said, well, wow, I'll find somebody who understands me. <laughs> Van Peebles moved to France, taught himself French, and took several journalism jobs until he was ready to apply for his director's license. It took nine years, but then he cranked out his first feature-length film, The Story of a Three-Day Pass a story about a black soldier who falls for a white woman while stationed in France. These are some of the guys from the base. Hello. We'll let you get back to your thing, but we'll tell everybody we saw you. It was in this film that Van Peebles used the double dolly shot, an effect that made his characters almost float instead of walk, a technique that almost two decades later would become Spike Lee's signature shot. His next film, The Watermelon Man, was about a white man who turns black and was backed by a major studio, Columbia Pictures, a rarity for a black filmmaker. Columbia would later offer Van Peebles a three-film deal, which he turned down. His next film, which he would write, produce, and star in as Sweetback, would create a blueprint for future black films to follow. He then moved to theater, writing two Tony-nominated musicals, releasing seven albums before collaborating with his son, Mario Van Peebles, in the creation of New Jack City. You're incapable of running this Sit your five dollars down before I make change. Melvin Van Peebles is being remembered as a man ahead of his time. He passed away on September 22nd. He was 89 years old. For Another View, I'm Lisa Godley. And a tribute to two outstanding men in our community. Thank you for spending an hour of your life with us. If you'd like to hear this show again or any Another View program, please visit our website, anotherviewradio.org, and download the podcast of your choosing. Or go to wherever you get your podcasts, and guess what? You'll find us right there. Next week on Another View, Wendy Sanford, author of These Walls Between Us. It's the story of friendship across racial lines. You want to hear this story. It's an incredible, incredible piece. Um, and Wendy Sanford, you all know, may know from the book Our Bodies, Ourselves. And so, you know, I also have to ask this. Have you gotten your shot? Pfizer boosters are now available for those who are eligible. But I implore you, those of you who have not gotten your first shot, Please do it today. Do it for your loved ones if you don't want to do it for yourself. It is so very important. And if you need uh, to find out where to go, you can go to uh, the state of Virginia, to the website, to the health department website, and find all the information you need right there. Our theme music is an original composition created especially for Another View by Jay Sennett. Lisa Godley is our show producer. Todd Washburn is our audio engineer. And Dr. Barry Graham answered our phones. Don't forget, you can come out to Williamsburg Baptist Church tomorrow, uh, October the 1st, from 3 to 4.30 in the sanctuary. Or you can go online. So go check it out and come hear Cyrus speak. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Have a fantastic weekend. And let's get together again next Thursday at noon for another view.
Support comes from Thomas Nelson Community College. Whether you want to start your bachelor's degree or advance your career through a short-term program, the first choice is Thomas Nelson Community College. More at tncc.edu slash first choice. Support comes from Hampton Roads Community Foundation, partnering with donors from all walks of life to improve southeastern Virginia through grants, scholarships, and leadership initiatives. Learn more at hamptonroadscf.org.